We are currently living in the golden age of video game adaptations. The Last of Us, Super Mario Bros, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and Five Nights at Freddy's are all examples of successful video game adaptations from the last year alone. There's going to be a Zelda adaptation, a Borderlands adaptation, a Fallout adaptation, just to name a few. JJ Abrams has people working on a Portal adaptation. I mean, how would you even do that? It's really looking like video game adaptations are becoming the next superhero trend in Hollywood. With all of these adaptations on the horizon, I thought that it would be a good time to look at an adaptation that was financially successful but was also considered to be a bad adaptation. Uncharted is a film directed by Ruben Fleischer, probably best known for the Venom films. Uncharted stars Tom Holland as the main protagonist, John Uncharted, and yeah, it's, it's not a good movie. In this video, I'm going to follow the film's narrative and focus on how the game series was adapted into the non-interactive medium. However, before we get to that, let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. The Uncharted series lends itself to adaptation as the games are linear action-adventure narratives which are already commonplace in Hollywood. There isn't any branching storylines or alternative endings that the player has an effect on. The sections in which the player is in control can be boiled down to running, shooting and climbing. The games also have some puzzles. Although it would seem like these sections would be difficult to adapt to a non-interactive medium, that isn't necessarily the case. Any climbing or shooting can be condensed into a well-choreographed action scene. In that sense, the climbing in Uncharted could be like that one scene in Mission Impossible 2. Notably, there's actually nothing like this in Uncharted, which is a shame, but I'm just spitballing here. A common critique that is levied against the Uncharted series is how Nathan Drake differs in the cinematics and the gameplay sections. Oh right, the protagonist of the Uncharted series is actually called Nathan Drake, not John Uncharted. <laughs> I hope you can forgive me for lying. Ludonarrative dissonance was coined to describe the odd sense sensation of watching Nate quip with his friends and then proceed to kill hundreds of people in the gameplay sections. Although I didn't personally have a problem with this aspect of the games, it's a video game, without the combat it would be very boring, I'm also happy to report that the film adaptation doesn't suffer from this issue. Sure, the film's version of Nathan Drake does kill a few people, but it is definitely not as commonplace as it is in the games. Regarding the story and its adaptation, the easiest thing in the world would be to just point towards the elements that they change from the games into the movie and call it bad based on those changes. If it ain't broke, don't fix it right? What I would like to do for this essay is a bit more challenging but also more rewarding in the long run. Rather than just state that Tom Holland is too young to play Nathan Drake, I'm going to instead ask, why doesn't Tom Holland work as Nathan Drake and isn't there room for an alternative take on the character, etc, etc. Hereby, just altering the source material doesn't necessarily make the adaptation automatically bad. Sure, if you're adapting Uncharted, we should be given Uncharted. This isn't Tomb Raider, Red Notice, National Treasure, or Indiana Jones. So with that in mind, let's get into it. This is how it was adapted, I'm Critical Coffee, and this is Uncharted. Spoilers for the Uncharted film and all the games except the Vita one because I didn't play it. Did actually anyone play it? Also Raiders of the Lost Ark, in case you haven't seen that one. Hi, editor here. This video keeps getting DMCA'd, so there might be some very creative editing solutions in this video. Sorry in advance. The film begins with Nathan Drake hanging in the air by his foot, which is lodged in some daisy chain debris that is falling from a plane. He begins to climb the debris as a goon, also stuck on the debris, pulls a gun on him. Nate then proceeds to kick the goon off into his death, after which we also get the first glance into the humor of the Uncharted film. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so sorry! That was purely reactive! It's very tempting to just dive right into why the humor in the film feels different from the games, but to do that we're first going to have to get a bit deeper into the story and the characters. I'm going to front load a compliment here and say that this sequence is a very interesting and attention grabbing way to begin the film. Although the sequence is clearly taken from Uncharted 3, the main inspiration for beginning in media res is clearly taken from the beginning of Uncharted 2 and Uncharted 4. The sequence also has a very important task of establishing the kind of narrative that Uncharted is going to be. Nathan Drake can do things that Olympic gymnasts couldn't. For example, he can jump on these boxes at the height of 8 kilometers, speeding through the air, 
probably 800 kilometers per hour. The film right away asks the audience to suspend their disbelief. For fans of the Uncharted games, this might be a revelation as to how ridiculous the things that you did in the games were. Non-fans might be bewildered as to how this guy can do this. Some Holland fans will assume that he's just doing his Spider-Man thing, and honestly, they're not entirely wrong. Regardless, it has to be noted that this sequence is totally in line with the games. The Uncharted games existed on their own logic, which has been carried over into this film. Some elements might strain credulity, but overall this is the kind of things that the games have been doing for years. Even in Uncharted 4, which was a bit more grounded. It works better in the games, as suspension of disbelief is easier when you're controlling the character and when the action is computer generated, but here I see it as the creators keeping in line with the tone of the source material. There's much more to say about this side of the adaptation, but there's a far, far more ridiculous scene in the film, which will be easier to dissect from this perspective. After this we get a bit of background on Nathan Drake's origins. Nathan and his older brother Sam attempt to steal Magellan's map, but are caught. This is adapted from Uncharted 4, which first introduced Sam as a character. This is actually one of the best things about this adaptation. As the game series had no idea that they were going to introduce Sam as a character in the fourth entry, they couldn't set up the character properly. It is weird that Sam never comes up throughout the games, even though Sully knows him, for example. It's a painful memory for Nate, yada yada, you can justify it however you like, and Uncharted 4 really tries to justify it, but there's no denying that laying the groundwork in the earlier entries would have been better. Sam doesn't even come up in Marlowe's background search on Nate during the third game, even though the brothers had been doing jobs together for a while. The film series, on the other hand, has the full roadmap and the characters that could appear, so Sam naturally can be set up better. That being said, do we get enough of Sam in this film? Probably not but he isn't the main focus of the narrative. They're clearly angling for a sequel, and considering how well the first film did at the box office, there's going to be an Uncharted 4 adaptation on the horizon. Sam's disappearance also gives Nate a more human motivation for his actions. Nate isn't just a treasure hunter, a part of the journey is to search for his brother. We then skip 15 years ahead. The now 25-year-old Nate has become a bartender in New York. While working that job, he steals from his customers. The film makes it a point to show that he only steals from the rich and or impolite customers, lest we consider Tom Holland a bad guy. This is when we are introduced to the film's version of Victor Sullivan. Mark Wahlberg as Victor Sullivan is hilariously bad casting, but I can't get into it yet. Trust me, we'll get there. Anyway, Sully spots that Nathan stole from one of the customers and the two banter a bit about it. This is the core dynamic between the two throughout the film. Quippy, Joss Whedon, Marvel type of dialogue, which is so afraid that the audience will get bored that every 10 seconds there has to be a witty one-liner or a sarcastic jab. I get that it is in vogue right now, but my god does it suck any semblance of drama from the narrative. Could you move any slower? I got a bad ankle, kid. I can't be running around out here. I know that many people will argue against this point by saying that the game Nathan Drake is just as witty and just as snarky, and that the original games are inspired by Joss Whedon and especially Firefly, so let's take a brief side tangent and talk about the concrete differences between the game Nate and Sully versus the film Nate and Sully. In the very first game, Uncharted Drake's Fortune, Nathan Drake and Victor Sullivan are introduced as business partners. The game begins with Sully saving Nate and Elena from a group of pirates. In case some of you aren't familiar with the original characters from the games, Elena is Nathan Drake's actual love interest instead of Chloe who is in this film. Then again, shame on you for experiencing the story of these classic games through this video. Anyway, Nate and Sully eventually abandon Elena and go search for the treasure as a twosome instead of a threesome. Who wrote this? Let's put a pin in this because it's very important to note about Nate as a character. He betrays Elena's trust in the first game and will do so again and again and again. While searching for the treasure, Sully gets shot, Nate comes to the conclusion that he is dead and continues his search for the treasure again with Elena. But dun dun dun, Victor isn't actually dead, leading Nate and Elena to suspect that maybe he had been playing for the opposite team 
all of this time. You've seen Indiana Jones, right? Right? Except Sully isn't trying to betray Nate, he was just misleading the opposite team. This is honestly something that Nathan Drake should have seen coming, considering that they have been hustling together since Nate was a literal child, but once again, they couldn't have guessed that they were going to make three more of these games. <coughs> <clears throat> Throughout the series, Sully becomes Nate's most trusted ally. He is in every game and he, more than any other ally, except maybe Elena, actually cares about Nate's well-being, even to the point that in Uncharted 4, he wants Nate to quit the treasure hunt and go back to his wife. Anyway, the partnership between the game Nate and Sully differs a lot from the film Nate and Sully. This is the moment where I will resort to referring to these characters as Game Nate and Game Sully, and Film Nate and Film Sully for the sake of clarity. When Film Nate and Film Sully meet, they're both adults. As much as the film relies on the spider manification of Nathan Drake, he is still an adult. He works in a bar, he has an apartment, etc, etc. He might act like a 16-year-old TikTok prankster, but make no mistake, the film wants us to know that he is just an immature adult. And I just do not by it. I don't know if the problem lies in my experience with Tom Holland being in the Spider-Man films where he convincingly portrays a teenager, or if it is a problem with the forced humor, but this version of Nathan Drake just feels off. Not only is Tom Holland too young to portray this role, but the tone behind the character is just wrong. Game Nate also quips and makes light of very serious situations and kills hundreds of goons throughout the series, but he is never this quippy. He wouldn't get someone a cat as a prank, for example. And we're getting to that, by the way. Now, don't get me wrong. Game Nate is facetious for sure, and he does pepper most moments with humor, but there's a difference between Game Nate serving up one-liners while he's mowing down a bunch of hostiles and film Nate chewing bubblegum at a classy event. There's a dry, sarcastic wit to Game Nate, especially when he is in dire straits. You overlooked one little detail, didn't you, partner? What? Face it, genius, you've been played. Oh, really? <gasps> hey, 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 jackass, you're ruining the show here. Ah, oh, what a shame. He often feels very pissy and tired about the situations that he is put in. Yeah, I could get this over the move. Think this through. Way to go, Nate. That didn't attract too much attention. There's a notable difference in the way that Nathan is portrayed morally in the film as opposed to the games. Remember when I mentioned that Game Nate betrays Elena's trust multiple times? Well, that's only possible because Game Nate actually fulfills the lovable rogue trope. His obsession with treasure hunting is his greatest strength and his greatest flaw at the same time. Film Nate doesn't fit into this trope at all. He is just far, far, far too kind for the narrative that he is in. You actually have to be a rogue to be a lovable rogue. The filmmakers were just too afraid that Film Nate wouldn't be likable if he had any immoral traits to him. He really does come off as a goody two shoes puppy dog. I suspect that a common counter argument is to just say that this is the origin story and that at some point Film Nate will become like he is in the games. He's a snarky puppy dog because he's so new to the treasure hunting business. Now, that might be the correct read, especially considering the after credit stinger. There even might be a darker Empire Strikes Back style second entry to the film series in the future. However, I can't really pull my punches in lieu of a potential future that might not even happen. There's just as high of a chance of Uncharted 2 being just like the first one, because the teens just love this version of Tom Holland. The first film also made a buttload of money, so there really isn't any incentive to change the style. Victor Sullivan isn't a cigar-chomping stereotype in the film. The difference between the game Sully and the film Sully is actually so great that it's tough to even decide where to start. Gone are the mustache, the Bahama shirts, the laid-back but also tired demeanor. Game Sully always felt like a guy that was 
five minutes away from retiring, but couldn't bring himself to do so because he wanted the thrills and the money. But you break them for us. I'm getting too old for this bullshit. Oh, come on now, don't you start this again. Listen, I don't have your luck. Guys like me gotta know when to walk away from the table. Sully, we're gonna get out of this, okay? We always do. Game Sully is suave and kind. He busts Nate's balls, but he does so lovingly. Mark Wahlberg doesn't really embody any of the characteristics of his game counterpart. The only thing similar is him being a sort of mentor for Nate. Mark Wahlberg is honestly just playing the character that he has been routinely playing for the last 10 years. Is there really that much of a difference between Victor Sullivan in this film and Kate Yeager in Transformers? On the topic of that post credit stinger, Film Sully does start to look like Game Sully, but we also have to note how having Game Sully for 30 seconds at the end doesn't necessarily fix the film before it. In fact, I think it points that the creators of this film knew that they could have adapted Sully more faithfully, but chose not to. Whether the reason for this is to have an original spin on the character or just to set up an origin story for him and Nate is impossible to say. I don't envy this side of the adaptation process. Considering that they clearly made an assorted effort to make the cast younger than the game counterparts, they obviously also had to change the dynamic between the characters a bit. Nate and Sully bantering five minutes into their relationship feels incredibly forced and never worked for me. Which begs the question, why did they cast this young? Uncharted was a project that was attached to so many filmmakers throughout the years. I remember the time when this was going to be directed by Dan Trachtenberg. Eventually, I think Sony realized that the film wasn't going to work only based on the hype behind the game series. It's a huge franchise for sure, but they just needed more. Obviously, people would have liked to see Nathan Fillion or Brendan Fraser in the role of Nathan Drake, but I think most of us also understood that these two were just too old for the role, especially when you're setting up a franchise with many sequels to follow. This also makes it pretty funny that Mark Wahlberg was originally going to be Nate, not Sully. That's how long this was in production. Hence the choice came down to an actor that could hold a franchise of this caliber on his shoulders, and someone Sony had already worked with, that being of course Tom Holland. I suppose in this scenario it also made sense to cast Sully more young as well. As I mentioned in the beginning, altering the source material isn't inherently a bad thing. However, if you're going to change a core element in the narrative, as the partnership between Nate and Sully is, then you have to make it compelling in some other way. I can kinda see what they tried to do with Sully and Nate in this narrative, but it just didn't work. It feels incredibly forced and ultimately unearned. Nate breaks into Sully's apartment where Sully is waiting for him. Sully tries to convince Nate to join him on the treasure hunt. Nate is not interested until Sully mentions that he used to work with Sam. As we already discussed, this is different from the games in which the sole motivation is the treasure hunt rather than a missing brother. I think this addition is in the story because the screenwriters assumed that an emotional motivation would be more compelling than a material one. It is also a clear way to communicate to the audience audience that even though Film Nate will steal jewelry and kill people in self-defense, mind you, he is still a good guy who's just trying to figure out what happened to his brother. Nate begins to plan for a heist where they're going to steal the MacGuffin that will lead them to the treasure. The MacGuffin doesn't relate to any of the games except that they've taken a real-life explorer and spun up a fictional treasure around their travels. The cross and the auction house are definitely inspired by Uncharted 4, but in general the two stories are barely similar. Nate comes up with a plan to steal the cross. He tells Sully that he needs a suit, some equipment, and a cat. This of course makes the audience think, oh wow, what is he going to do with the cat? Is he going for the Ocean's 12 hell in a handbasket strategy? Hey Larry, not enough people. The soft shoulder. Not enough people. Baker's dozen. No woman and not enough people. Hell in a handbasket. We can't train a cat that quickly. And not, not enough people. people. And no, it's just a joke, I guess. He wanted to give Sully a cat because Sully is lonely or something like that. 
Now, I would like to note that this could be a good joke, on paper at least. They even further elaborate on the bit as later on Sully actually wants to check up on the cat as he's grown attached to it. As I already mentioned, Game Nate really wouldn't adopt a cat as a joke. Film Nate is established as this prankster who will get Sully a cat as a lark. I mean, do you actually know how much responsibility taking care of a cat is? Sully is going to have to redecorate his entire apartment, hide all the wires, clean cat poop and never open the windows again. Ha ha, what a funny prank. And I say this as someone who has two cats. In all seriousness though, this is just a single example of how the Uncharted film just doesn't get Game Nate as a character. He will quip and be witty, but he would never in a million years just adopt a cat as a joke. Why did they do this? I suspect that the target audience of Uncharted skews very young. At the auction house, Nate and Sully begin their heist. As I already mentioned, this heist is very similar to the fourth game, in which Nate, Sam and Sully steal a MacGuffin cross while tending an auction, where the villains are trying to buy the MacGuffin. Here the film introduces a new character, Joe Braddock, who is the leader of the mercenary group that is going after the treasure with Santiago Moncada, the last surviving inheritor of the treasure. Joe Braddock is a pretty clear adaptation of Nadine Ross from Uncharted 4. They're both people of color lead a mercenary group and are given scenes where they destroy men in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's actually so similar that I don't understand why they didn't just use the Nadine Ross name here. Maybe they're setting up a sequel that leads into The Lost Legacy or something like that, which would be impossible with Joe Braddock as, spoilers, she gets game-ended in this film. Once again, I bump against the casting age here. The Uncharted wiki says that Joe Braddock is in her 30s, but <laughs> once again, I just have a hard time buying it. Tati Gabriel, who portrays Braddock, is 27, and I'm just going to state plainly that she looks way too young to be a leader of a mercenary group. She doesn't look 30 in the slightest, and honestly, I'm kinda left asking like, what kind of a life path has she taken that she has become the leader of this mercenary group so young? And that's not even taking into account that she's been doing this for years, to the point that she was the one who shot Sam when they were looking for the treasure originally. Also, Sully and Joe are on a first name basis here. The movie kind of implies that the two were a couple at some point. I believe you walked out on me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Did you miss this, Victor? And I, I, I just gotta wonder, what the actual f*** <gasps> were they thinking here? Uh, which way did Chloe go? See you later. Oh, no. <laughs> You're a dirty old man, Sullivan. Uh-huh. It should be noted that the problem with Joe Braddock definitely isn't her being a woman. Some have critiqued Nadine Ross for being this unstoppable force who can beat any man to a pulp whenever she wants to, but I honestly never had a problem with that aspect of Uncharted 4. I think it's hilarious when Nate gets up to fight her, only for her to absolutely destroy him in the process, all the while the puzzled player retains control of Nate. With Nadine Ross, it's actually plausible that she might have extensive years worth of experience in the the ass kicking business. She's a bit older than Joe Braddock. With Braddock, I just don't buy it. I suspect that I will get some pushback on this. Why doesn't Braddock pass the Nadine Ross test when we're clearly in an elevated setting anyway? A guy like Nathan Drake wouldn't be able to climb this Daisy Jane of boxes in midair either, so why am I drawing the line on my suspension of disbelief on Joe Braddock being a leader of a group of mercenaries? Because the film does virtually nothing to establish or sell Joe Braddock to the audience. We don't learn how she became the leader of the mercenaries. Was there an inner conflict? Did she capture the leadership position with a coup d'etat? Why didn't the Scottish guy become the leader? If I know anything about old guys, they immediately get angry when someone younger than them tells them what to do. And let's be honest here, it's even worse if you're a woman. So how was Joe Braddock able to establish herself as this leader who will not be betrayed by a bunch of bloodthirsty greedy men? It is not physical prowess, let me tell you. She does beat up three guys in a very entertaining scene, but later on Joe gets beat up by 
Sully in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Let me repeat that, Sully of all people beats Joe. Later on, even Nate beats her one-on-one. -on -one. Let's set aside for a moment the fact that she's young. Even if the character was older and was given a backstory about how she came to power, she still doesn't pose a threat in the slightest. You can't undercut the villain's powers this bad and then expect them to be a menace for the rest of the narrative. It drains all the stakes out of the narrative immediately. Compare her to Belloc in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, for example. Technically, Indiana Jones never beats Belloc. Indiana is the better treasure hunter for sure, but at the end of the narrative, Belloc eventually beats Jones by calling out his bluff and appealing to his feelings for Marion. It's obvious that Braddock isn't going to beat Nate in the treasure hunt. However, she can't out-mercenary him either. So where's the tension in the narrative? You could fill in the blanks in the way of the last legacy. For example, Nadine Ross inherited the mercenary group Shoreline from her father. Except, once again, this isn't Nadine Ross. This is Joe Braddock. Anyway, the auction begins, Nate tries to cut the power, fails to do so, and forces Sully to bid a lot of money on the cross. This is pretty much like it is in Uncharted 4, except how it will conclude. There's some playful banter between the aforementioned Scottish goon and Nate. We're about to get a proper Scottish welcome. I'm sorry? To the screenwriter's credits, this is actually original and kind of feels like something game Nate would say and do. Nate escapes and interrupts the auction. Sully escapes with the cross and leaves Nate to fend for himself. Nate does eventually escape and meets Sully back at their car, where he confronts Sully about the backstabbing. This is a new addition to the series. As I mentioned earlier, the first Uncharted game flirts with the concept of Sully backstabbing Nate, but it subverts that trope. Here in the film, there's a more common trope of no honor among thieves. Sully might betray Nate, Nate might betray Sully, although we all know that won't happen. Chloe might betray Nate, Sully, or both of them at the same time. I think the general inspiration for this lies in Uncharted 2, where Nate is first betrayed by Flynn and later with Chloe playing both sides. This aspect is one of those positive sides to this adaptation. Sully being untrustworthy builds him as a more interesting character. Anyone who's played the games will know that Game Sully would never betray Game Nate, and that isn't the case here. Although the betrayals and the core dynamics could be better, I still do like this change. While I'm trying to stay positive and comment on the bits that worked with the film, I do also have to note how the Uncharted film falls short of virtually every other Uncharted narrative in this honor among thieves aspect. For example, there's nothing in this narrative that comes even close to the Sam reveal in Uncharted 4. Nate and Sully travel to Barcelona, where they meet aforementioned film Chloe. Predictably, Chloe doesn't want to cooperate and just steals the cross for herself. I know that this doesn't relate to the adaptation of Uncharted in the slightest, but having watched this film like five times now for this essay, can we take a moment and recognize that it is physically impossible for Chloe to steal the cross from Nate in this scene? They're literally facing each other, Chloe isn't anywhere near Nate's backpack where he keeps the cross, and yet somehow she is able to steal it. This is not sleight of hand, this is witchcraft or quantum mechanical manipulation. While we're on the topic of Chloe, let's talk about her characterization in the film as opposed to the games. Chloe appears in Uncharted 2, 3 and Lost Legacy. She's initially introduced as Nate's love interest, but as Nate reunites with Elena, she resigns to being one of Nate's treasure hunter buddies. As a character, Game Chloe isn't afraid to use her sex appeal to her advantage. She's able to play both sides of the treasure hunt in Uncharted 2 simply by appealing to both Flynn and Nate sexually. That's why it has to be an inside job. From someone they know and trust. Oh. Okay, I see where this is going. I just need a diversion. You give me five minutes in that tent, that's all it'll take. Really? Five minutes? Well, that's great. I won't even have to get my top off. Chloe, I was thinking more like an explosion. Or that can be arranged. However, in the later entries, this aspect of her was toned down. Film Chloe is a bit difficult to pinpoint as a character, to be honest. We hear that she's been exploring since she was very young and that she was betrayed by her father. This causes her to doubt everyone around her and eventually betray Nate, multiple times. In the film version, the sex appeal is totally gone, but I don't think that would have fit the tone of the film anyway. Even the games veered heavily away from this aspect of her character in the later entries. 
What is more upsetting is how the film chooses to massively downplay her treasure hunting abilities. In The Lost Legacy, Chloe is just as competent as Nate as an explorer and historian. She has the benefit of hunting something that her father has been after since she was a child, but even with that notion, I never got the sense that she couldn't hold her own in the games. In the film, she is largely clueless and relies on betraying Nate again and again to keep up with the treasure hunt. If you haven't noticed yet, this film has a problem with undercutting the female characters. It should be noted that even the inclusion of Chloe is an interesting adaptation choice in itself. As I mentioned, the main love interest of Nate in the game series is Elena Fisher, who appears in every single Uncharted game except Lost Legacy. In fact, Elena is a far more integral part of Uncharted in comparison to Chloe or even Sully, to be honest. I think the reason that they chose to use Chloe instead of Elena in the film is because Elena isn't really a character that could betray Nate. Elena has a very, very, very strong moral compass, like literally the most righteous character in the entire series, so she doesn't fit into this Honor Among Thieves style of narrative. Nate, Chloe and Sully agree to cooperate, although the mutual trust begins to get tested almost immediately. It is kind of bizarre that no one but Nate was able to get the church tree clue, considering that they have a cross on their hands. I mean, it is exactly like the games where Nate is the only one who knows what's going on, except maybe in 3 where Cutter also knows a bit, and in 4 where Sam actually knows more about pirates than Nate, but I just found it a bit funny. There's some character building in the next scenes. As these characters don't resemble their game counterparts in the slightest, there really isn't any point to talk about how these conversations were adapted from the games. Because they weren't. Although these scenes weren't really interesting in the slightest, I want to give props to the screenwriters at least in the sense that they knew to add scenes which flesh out the dynamics of this trio in their off time. The chats that are had between characters while exploring are often the best part of the Uncharted games, so it is nice to see them sort of return here. We also learn about the main antagonist Santiago Moncada. Santiago's father is planning on giving away their fortune as reparations for past sins or something. This part isn't adapted from any Uncharted game, and I have to admit here, it is pretty interesting. To be perfectly clear, there have been all sorts of villainous bankrollers in the games, but none of them have had backstories like these. In the end, Uncharted villains are fairly mustache twirling and comically evil, as tends to be the case with the genre conventions of the action-adventure film. Lest we forget that Indiana Jones fought against literal nazis. You think I am a monster? But you're no different from me, Drake. <laughs> that is to say that although it is commendable that they added some background to this villain, it really doesn't go anywhere, nor does it matter at all to the plot. The real villain ends up being Joe Braddock, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The trio start the treasure hunts at the church. I won't spend time recapping the sequence, as it isn't really adapted from any of the games, but I think they did an okay job of maintaining that uncharted feeling. There's banter between the characters, interspersed with moments of action, etc. It's not the most compelling treasure hunt, but it's perfectly fine. A painfully obvious negative side of an Uncharted adaptation is that the audience can no longer participate in the puzzle solving. This is an integral part of the game series and it's nice to see it return with this adaptation. However, I think they could have gone a bit further with the puzzles. The heaven and hell gimmick is interesting and builds on the narrative's idea of honor among thieves, but apart from that, it's very forgettable. Considering that they've already incorporated some very very unrealistic stuff into the film, they could have gone a bit flashier with this puzzle. Nate saves Chloe from a watery grave showing that Nate actually cares about the people surrounding him and not just about finding the treasure and getting a bigger cut. This is totally in line with game Nate as well, but I just can't help but to feel like this would have been a more surprising act with game Nate. Once again, game Nate is an actual lovable rogue whereas film Nate more feels like this puppy dog who happens to like history. And that's not even me, even the film itself points this out. You're a good guy, Nate. After this, Chloe betrays Nate. I'll admit that this genuinely surprised me, even though it's pretty clear from the get-go. They're not going to make Sully the guy that betrays Nate. Once again, this kind of seems inspired by Chloe in Uncharted 2, even though she never fully betrays Nate in that game. Nate questions Sully about Sam. Sully finally tells the truth about how he abandoned Sam during a shootout resulting in Sam's demise. He then, in a very tone-deaf move, still demands information from Nate. 
you? So that's what this is about. You dragged me all the way out here. Let me believe that I might see my brother again because you think that I know something? Yeah. Do you? I really did bump against this because Sully is never this tone deaf in the game series, but I'm beating a dead horse at this point. The reason that Sully acts this way is to make the audience question if he will eventually start to care about Nate and not just about the treasure. This of course sets up the wholesome ending where Sully chooses saving Nate instead of the treasure. It is revealed that dun dun dun, Chloe has been working with Mankata this entire time. But the film isn't done with the plot twists. Suddenly, Braddock slits Moncada's foot, making her the main antagonist of the narrative. What surprised me about this scene was that it is clearly inspired by the first Uncharted game, in which the main antagonist, Roman, is betrayed by his second-hand man, Navarro. This actually might be the only thing that is borrowed from the first game. As a plot twist, it's kind of flawed considering that it totally undercuts the earlier story concerning Moncada's background. I guess one could argue that it's a subversion in the sense that you're expecting Moncada to be this great villain, but he was just a stepping stone for Joe Braddock. I guess the casting of Antonio Banderas kind of plays into this as well. This would make Braddock a more interesting character if she wasn't so bare bones otherwise. The airplane sequence is of course from Uncharted 3, but instead of getting stranded on a desert, all alone, Film Nate gets stranded at sea with Film Chloe. Kinda a shame because I really like the desert sequence in the third game. As to why it's like this, your guess is good as mine. I guess it's easier to write yourself out of being stranded at sea rather than the desert. Eventually Nate and Chloe find land. It should be noted that they survive this situation entirely by coincidence. Nate and Chloe don't actually do anything to find land, they literally just stumble onto it. This strikes me as a very bizarre screenwriter choice as the narrative just lets these two off the hook. Why would you write them to be lost at sea when you're going to let them off the hook this easy? The film does try to flesh out their dynamic a bit here, but it's barely a justification for the scene as they have a 10 minute sequence in a hotel following this. Truly, truly bizarre. There's the easter egg with Nolan North that everyone really liked. Fell out of a car that fell out of a plane? Huh. Hey, you know, something like that happened to me once. <laughs> Sanovat, se joka varjo on tyytyy, valon ihmeestä paitsi jää. <laughs> From this point on, there isn't much to say about the film adaptation-wise. Game Nate and Game Chloe don't spend time in a hotel trying to solve puzzles in any of the games, although there's a pretty saucy scene with them in a hotel room in Uncharted 2. <laughs> The movie pays off the setup of Nate and Sam giving each other messages written in invisible ink. This is totally original to the film and I think it works well. Chloe backstabs Nate again, but thank god Nate's not an inexperienced puppy dog anymore. Nate finds the treasure alone. Joe Braddock, bizarrely, by happenstance, just spots Nate speeding to the location of the treasure. The games as well struggle with the antagonist somehow always finding where Nate and the gang were going, but this is just incredibly lazy on the screenwriter's part. Sully also has followed Nate to the treasure. This actually does work, as Sully had a tracking app for Nate that they established in an earlier scene. The clear inspiration for the setting is Uncharted 4, although in that game the gang is searching for Libertalia, a whole city, whereas here they're looking for ships filled with gold. However, the fourth game's climax takes place in a ship inside a cave that is very similar to the adaptation. How did they get those ships in there? I don't know, man. Don't ask me. The film's climax isn't akin to anything in the games. Joe Braddock decides to fly out the ships with helicopters. Nate and Sully steal one of the helicopters and ships, and thus a high-speed pursuit in the air ensues. The Uncharted games weren't ever known for their realism, but the way that the movie functions from this point on is kinda insane. Not only would these 15th century ships break down from the slightest tug of anything with an engine, you certainly couldn't fly with them like this. This isn't Nate commenting on the age of a rope in Uncharted 2. Sure, let's just swing across on the 70 year old rope. 
this is something entirely different. I'm bumping against this just because the film, by virtue of being live action, doesn't lend itself as well to these flights of fancy. This isn't completely the screenwriter's fault. They had the job of adapting Uncharted, and they did adapt Uncharted, but then again, there's also an argument to be made about how the best version of this narrative doesn't rely on the same logic as the games do. Sure, something like Star Wars doesn't follow the rules of space either, but Uncharted is a bit more rooted in our modern reality that things like this just feel a bit off. Sully and Nate defend their ship from Braddock's mercenaries. There's some unintended comedy in a film Nate finding a bag of gunpowder and marveling over it. Gunpowder. Even though he doesn't even know that he's going to need it for the climax in two minutes. <laughs> okay, so honestly, watching the film, I honestly thought he was going to blow it onto someone's face and light a match or something like that. I did not see the cannon coming. Joe Braddock makes it onto Nate and Sully's ship by nothing short of a miracle. Nate and Joe duke it out and Nate gets saved by Sully dumping all of his gold onto Braddock. And with that, the two fly off into the sunset. This final bit is wholly original to the film, although there is typically a combat section with the designated heavy in the games as well. Just like in the games, the bulk of the treasure is lost. Nate has cashed away some goodies just like Sully in the first game. As a storytelling mechanic, this makes sense as Nate always has to have the motivation to go on another treasure hunt. One thing that is missing from this adaptation is the supernatural elements from the games. The supernatural elements have been a staple of the original trilogy, although they did away with that in Uncharted 4 and with the more grounded tone. In my mind, this is a good choice. It also leaves the door open if they want to get real weird with it in the sequels. There are two post credit scenes in Uncharted. The first one shows Sam alive in a jail cell, implying that there's going to be a sequel which adapts that side of Uncharted 4. In the second post credit scene, Nate goes to a bar to meet a goon named Gage, portrayed by Pillow Aspect. You might remember him from Game of Thrones as Discount Jack Sparrow. The finger in the bomb. Gage is trying to exchange Nate's valued ring to a map, kinda like the beginning of Uncharted 3. This is the moment where the film makes the first attempt to lean into the game series in a more transparent way. The film also name drops Roman, who is the villain of the first game, so he's probably going to be the villain of the second film. In the introduction for this video, I mentioned that an adaptation of Uncharted should feel like Uncharted. This isn't Tomb Raider, Red Notice, National Treasure, or Indiana Jones. After the first view of the film, I knew that the film didn't feel like the game series, but what came as a surprise was that it didn't feel like any of these other action-adventure films either. Say what you will about Red Notice, at least it knows what it wants to be. I never got the sense that Uncharted knew what it wanted to be. It's easy to point out the things that are different between the film and the games. None of these changes in themselves constitute a label of bad adaptation, but then again, if you're going to use the Uncharted intellectual property, why wouldn't you use the core elements from the games? The Uncharted film doesn't feel like Uncharted. It's Uncharted in its appearance, but it's missing almost everything that made the original game series compelling in the first place. If the Uncharted series is a Porsche, then the film adaptation is a Nissan with the Porsche logo drawn on the hood with crayon. There's nothing wrong with it, but you really shouldn't call it a Porsche. Maybe that's enough. The audience score on Rotten Tomatoes sure seems to suggest that people were completely okay with this adaptation. But I just can't help but to feel like not only does the film lack the core of the Uncharted series, but it also just feels incredibly bland as an action-adventure film. I haven't talked about the Indiana Jones films in this essay because it's too much to hold the Uncharted film up against the standards of one of the most iconic film characters and franchises ever. However, there's no denying that the series in its entirety has been inspired by those films. The original concept of Uncharted was what if you were Indiana Jones hunting treasure, solving puzzles, and getting the girl. However, over the years the game series actually found its own identity. The DNA of Uncharted became the character dynamics and the elaborate action set pieces. Elements which are in the adaptation for sure, but as a cheap imitation 
adaptation of the original. The Last of Us adaptation also had its problems, but I would never call that show a cheap imitation of the original. In the end, it's not difficult to parse out why the studios chose to call this Uncharted, rather than Honor Among Thieves or some other generic action-adventure title. Intellectual property is everything in Hollywood currently, and without that title, the movie wouldn't have been made. In fact, it barely got made even with the Uncharted title. Moving ahead, we should ask why we want things adapted in the first place. Video game adaptations serve to make stories accessible to audiences beyond the gaming realm. My parents might not engage with The Last of Us by playing the game, but a television adaptation could bridge that gap, offering them access to its exceptional narrative. With Uncharted, why would I recommend my parents a narrative that barely resembles the original? Why would I sour their first experience of the series with a film that fundamentally misunderstands what made the game series so great. You're gonna miss this ass.